morning. I am thrilled to be here with you. And along with me is our Deputy Director, Pamela Mava, who is running the whole show behind the scenes for us today. We are just so excited that you are all with us. This is a very big day for the Professional Development Institute. I want to acknowledge um, all of the partnerships because all of you should know that we are working in partnership with not only our county, of course, Miami-Dade County and Monroe are two counties, but Broward County Early Learning Coalition, as well as the Palm Beach Early Learning Coalition. And for this and the January trainings uh, for Super Class Saturday, we will continue to partner with Teachstone. And so we're very lucky today to have um, Maria Cristina Caro with us today, and you'll hear from her in a little while. Um, this is a, a huge um, push, as, as Pamela Hollingsworth has told you, um, to really support all that teachers are required um, to understand and know about the class assessment. And we are uh, just thrilled that we can bring that to you today. So we're going to be together until 1230, and we have a very full and tight schedule. I would like to um, also acknowledge the other folks that are with us. The round table is, um, is gonna be run by our moderator, Sandra Ampudia. And Sandra is a friend of all of ours for many years. She is a class observer and has enormous experience in doing this. She will moderate the panel for, there's Sandy right there so you all can see her. Good morning, Sandy. From Miami-Dade County, um, the two observers that will be presenting in the round table are Anna Maria Farkas and Amanda Bosano. For uh, Broward County, um, we will have Amy Hamui and Stephanie Templin. And thank you, Stephanie. And there you are, and Amy. And for Palm Beach, we will have Christelle Miller and Elizabeth Ibarra. So we are incredibly uh, lucky to have them all at this round table. The round table brings to you the uh, expertise of these observers who have been doing this for a long time. They're gonna give you excellent information that you should uh, really uh, pay attention to and, uh, and understand in a better way once they share with you. So we're just thrilled and excited uh, to be with you today. And we're going to actually, I'm gonna go ahead um, and begin this because why keep talking? I, I, I'm not the important person here today, our colleagues are. So um, Sandy, I'd like to introduce you. So Sandy Ampudia has been, uh, she actually has worked for the Early Learning Coalition in the past. And now Sandy is a consultant for many of our coalitions. She is a, an observer at the highest levels um, for the class observation. She understands this, she understands quality in the classroom and she brings to, um, to us today uh, her guidance and support for the round table. So Sandy, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Anna, and thank you. Welcome everyone, we're so happy to have you here. I noticed that some people just wanna check and see if uh, we can see you. Just wanna remind you that this is a webinar format, so you won't be able to see yourself in the screen. So I know that some people is trying to uh, open the cameras and see if you're in. We can see you all if you're writing your names in the chat. We know you're here. Thank you for being here. You are just going to see um, our round table panelists and uh, the people from the ELC in your screen but we wanna acknowledge that you are here. So welcome everyone. Uh, so thank you, Anna and Pam and Pamela uh, for hosting this great event. As we were explaining, we're gonna have a great conversation among these uh, great uh, colleagues and educators, dedicated educators that are around your classroom. So um, we'd like to go and do a little bit of introduction so you would like to know who we are uh, and you would like to um, tell your name, your position, your background, uh, years of experience. So our participants get to know us a little bit. So if we can start from the north to the south, can we introduce uh, 
would you like to introduce yourself, our Palm Beach uh, colleagues? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christelle Miller. I am an assessment specialist at the Early Learning Coalition of Palm Beach County. Um, let's see. So a little background information on me. I've been in the early childhood uh, field for 18 years now. I started when my daughter was one, um, been an assessment specialist for four years with the Early Learning Coalition, but I've been doing um, observations for about 10 years now. Uh, let's see what else. I think that's it. I think I covered everything. I'm so happy to be here and be invited on this Super Saturday event. So thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. Good morning. My name is Melissa Rivera, and I'm an assessment specialist at the Palm Beach County also. Um, I have been in the early childhood field for more than 20 years already. And I began like as a floater. Then I, uh, I was able to be an assistant teacher. Uh, Head Start Director, and um, now and I'm an assessor or a pre-K observer, a class observer. I also um, have a master's degree in early childhood education and instruction and curriculum. And also uh, I have the opportunity to be a master coder for class and CGC coach, uh, as well as Christelle and pre-K class trainer. So welcome everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, our Broward County colleague. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Hamley. I am the Director of Program Assessment at uh, the Broward Early Learning Coalition. Um, I am so happy to be here today. I see a lot of familiar faces because I used to also work in um, Miami-Dade County um, in the Quality Counts Program. So I, I, it's wonderful to see a lot of familiar uh, names. Um, I also worked in Head Start as a director, and I too worked at the Early Learning Coalition of Miami, Dave Monroe, way back in 2004, 2005. So now you know, I go back a while. Um, but I'm super excited to be here and to see everyone's enthusiasm and um, wanting to get this great information around Teachstone and class and uh, program assessment. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Templin. I also work with the Early Learning Coalition of Broward County. I am an education manager and I've been with the organization for four and a half years. Through my whole uh, Florida career, I have been involved with class. I am a class observer in three different age groups, as well as a class group coaching instructor. I have been in preschool for 20 years. I have a four and a half year old daughter. So I've kind of lived class through a parent's perspective too, which was an interesting experience. And I'm just really, um, really honored to be here today. And I hope that you take away something great with you back to your classroom. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Stephanie. And maybe you know some of our sisters from Miami Day. Some familiar faces. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Anna Maria Farkas. I'm an uh, early childhood assessor lead at Miami Dade Monroe. I have been a preschool teacher in the 80s. I was a preschool director in the 80s. Yes, I'm very old. Um, I've worked with children with special needs as an assistant behavior analyst at the University of South Florida. And I have been a class observer. I was actually with Devro back in the early 2000s. I did ERS. Um, environmental rating scales assessments. And now I've been doing the class since 2010. I'm also um, a trainer for the class. Been here for a very long time. Nice to see all my friends. I mean, Elizabeth and I go way back. Uh, and nice to see all my friends for, that I haven't seen in a while. Thank you, Anne. Good morning, I'm Amanda Bolsano. I am an early childhood assessor here at uh, Miami Dade and Monroe. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and I've been doing class assessments for the past five years in all three tools, infant, toddler, and pre-K. Happy to be here. So thank you everyone. As you see, we're a great uh, team uh, that gathered together to talk to you about class. We know you have a lot of questions and would like to have a conversation to explain to you uh, general principles and general uh, practices that we do when we go out and observe your classroom. So let's start with 
would like to explain to our providers what is the process to become a class observer. I can take that one. Um, when we started, it was a two-day training. Now it's a three-day training. Um, after you've done your training for three days, you have to take a series of video exams and you have to pass the video exams that have been master coded and you have to pass them in order to become an assessor. Um, that's pretty much it to become an assessor. Then after that, we have each, each of the counties has different things that they do. Once we become an assessor in Dade, we also have to go out with a very seasoned assessor, a lead, and pass three separate assessments with them before you can go out on your own. I don't know how the other counties do it. Hi, we do Anna the Maria. same. Sorry, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. I was go gonna say Palm, it's the go ahead, it's, Palm Beach. Go ahead, we'll come out. It's the you. same. It's the same process in um, Palm Beach County. We like to pair our new assessors with, like you said, a seasoned assessor. Especially, we have many on our team that were also master coders, and they do the same three process, and you know, just uh, going together to make sure they understand how to do the tool and they're using that correctly. Yes, in Broward, we also do the same thing. We want to make sure that any new um, assessor is paired up um, multiple times with a seasoned um, assessor. And even especially with the notes, um, we spend a lot of time working on those notes to make sure that you know we're uniform across the board in how our, our notes um, justify the codes and even just the way they're they're written because we do want to make sure that everyone once they receive their reports understands why they um, received the score that they did. Okay, thank you so much. So that's the beginning of how we become a class of service. But our providers will be wondering how we renew our observation skills. Uh, and what is the calibration of double coding process that sometimes they hear about it? So would you like to explain to our providers how often do we need to review our certifications and what are the different processes that we use to keep our observation skills in place? I can take that one because I'm in the middle of a renewing my credentials right now for my infant certification. So every year you're given a window where you have to retake the test with different videos where you have to score within the perfect, the right ranges with for the master coders to pass. And you have to pass um, um, a certain criteria to be able to assess again, or you have to retake the test and you get three chances. However, we do, um, take mini tests almost, I would call it. They're called calibrations. And that's really to keep sure that everyone who is assessing out in the field are um, are in line with the master coders. So they're in line with knowing what, what they're looking at and knowing how to score and organize it. And we also, like the ladies were speaking about, we go out with addition, with, with, we partner together and do double coding. So that means we go with another seasoned or unseasoned, depending on you know where you are in the process. You go with another um, coworker and you perform an observation together and you score and you code, and then you compare those scores and codes afterwards to be sure that you're in line with each other. So you know that we're both at, um, at calibration. That means we're both seeing what we're supposed to be seeing at the classroom. We're noticing we have our class lenses on, as they like to call it. We're looking at interactions. We're not looking at anything else that might influence our opinion. We're doing it based on justifiable examples that we're writing down. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Uh, right. Real quick, Sandra, I just want to yeah. piggyback off what Stephanie said. There is also additional testing for those of us that are trainers. So I know Anna Maria said she's a train the trainer. I am. Elizabeth is. There may be somebody else here. We also have to retest during that window. So um, they're keeping everybody at a high level of expertise to make sure that they're doing the same thing and keeping, like Stephanie said, that class lens at all times. Thank you, Christelle. Any other comment that you would like to add to explain to our providers how often we need to renew our credentials and uh, the processes that we use? Well, I mean, I could add that I know that um, Elizabeth and I, I don't know who else, I'm sure there are other people here. We've done master coding where we are at Teachstone and we are part of a group who watch a video and then we decide the master code and that, so it's, it's a group effort. It's not just one person deciding the score. It's a group effort. You discuss the video totally in depth and you come up with a score and that's how the master code is um, defined. And that's what everybody goes up against. Thank you, Ana Maria. As you can tell, this is a very um, complex uh, process that we do uh, when we go out and collect data through our observations, we write what we see, we write what we hear. Then we have a full training that gives us and a manual that gives us guidelines to align all those behaviors and assign you that scoring, uh, that score that, that you get. So as you can tell, this is a process. This is a process of uh, objective observations, analysis, and then writing reports. So, uh, you will say, okay, but how does the day of observation look like from the assessor perspective? Would you like to tell our providers uh, what do we do that full day of observation, like the prep, the before, can take that before, and after? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank okay. You. So on the day of the observation, we arrive early into your school. Um, we review your classroom list to make sure that the tool that we're using is appropriate for the ages of the children that you work with. And after that, we go into your classroom. We um, normally um, introduce ourselves to you and remind you that we are not allowed to talk to you. So we don't, don't interrupt your activities with your children. So we can see like a normal proce procedure or your normal routine in your classroom. After that, we do, uh, cycles we observe you uh, for about normally four cycles also we can do six but uh, regularly is four cycles those cycles are about 15 to 20 minutes we observe you uh, looking to see all of the dimensions and behavioral markers um, during your interactions with the children when we do those 15 to 20 minutes then we stop we score uh, so you're going to see us maybe uh, look into our manuals, our books to see if we're uh, assigning the correct uh, scores to you. And after we finish those 10 minutes of scoring, we start a new cycle. And we do that for four uh, cycles in consecutive. And if, for example, if you are a toddler teacher or an infant teacher, we normally, if you go outside during the observation, we go outside with you and also observe you. But if you are a pre-K class teacher, we don't observe outside. And the reason behind this is because the pre-K pre children, since they are like um, older, when they go, out, they go outside, like they're running around all, all the playground. So it's difficult for you to have interactions with each of the children. So that's why we don't observe outside if you are a pre-K teacher. And pre-K is from three years old to five years old. And, um, and normally with infants and toddlers, you are near the children during playground time because you have to help them, assist them, and, and you have those interactions with them. And after that, uh, we leave your school and we go to our uh, office or jobs, right? And we write a report where we write the evidence of what we observed, what you did, um, that were the behaviors that represent class is looking for. And in case that you are not showing one of those behaviors, we write also those. So you know in which ways you can grow and get better in your interactions with the children. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. It looks like a full day, isn't it? <laughs> so you will be wondering why, and we'd like to explain you why it's important that the day of the observation, we don't have interactions with the teacher or with the children that we are observing. Would you like to explain why we're just in a little corner writing? Would you like to explain to our providers why we cannot interact with them? I can talk a little about that, just piggybacking off what Elizabeth said. Part of it is not intruding on your um, interactions with the children, but I think it helps us remain objective um, and you know focus on what we're doing. We have a lot of evidence to catch, and if we're distracted by conversations or talking with children, we won't be able to pick that up. But you know, we have to remain objective. It's not like I'm visiting my best friend's class and oh, she didn't do that, but I'm not going to write it. So we want to just uh, you know remain objective, stay true to the tool, and keep our focus on that because like she said we have these manuals they're pretty big you might not be able to see it oh no you can't see but it's big and we're, we're, we're focusing on that and trying to catch all there we go Stephanie's got hers up <laughs> and Sandra's got hers so it's really part of just remaining objective and, and true to the tool and, and it allows you to focus in a corner away from the rest of the group and, and if I could add also if the teacher's interacting with us she's not interacting with her classroom and we're there to watch her with her classroom and just like Christelle said, we're not visiting, we're observing. I always say I'm a fly on the wall. Yes, and I see in the chat that somebody was asking if, this, uh, if I say that we don't, do not observe outside. And that's right. If you are a pre-K teacher, we do not observe outside. But I want to clarify, Elizabeth, because we are allowed to catch your transition in or outside. So I personally do go outside because I love the warm weather. I'm freezing inside the building, right? So I love to sit outside and I will start my observation again once you are transitioned and lining up to come back inside. It is important that we capture the entire day. And part of your day are those transitions. And it is in the tool to capture transitions. So you may get an assessor like me who sits outside with you to capture that. And with, uh, you know, VPK, it's on a time limit, right? So we have to finish within those VPK hours. And if you go outside, we want to be able to get our tool in and give you a full 20 minutes rather than having to cut your cycle in half or shorter. That's right, Christelle. Thank you so much. And also, uh, just to clarify, because there's like a lot of information, but if you are in a pre-K class and you are outside, if you are doing like a specific activity where you are interacting with all children, for example, if you go and take paint and do painting outside, or you do, I think somebody wrote something about if you are doing a science experiment outside, uh, we observe that because you are interacting with those with all your classroom during that time. So that's the only time that we can observe you uh, like Christelle says, your transition, or if you're doing a specific activity with all your children during that time. Yes, exactly. That's that's what I was about to add. That what Elizabeth said is true. If it's a, a group activity, if it's a teacher structured activity, we will observe that. It's only free play. What, what Elizabeth was talking about was free play when the kids are out there with no structure, they're just playing wherever. We don't observe that, but we do observe any structured activities outside, like that obstacle course. If the teacher is set up and the children have to participate, that is a structured activity and we will observe that. Thank you. I think that it's important for our providers to know um, why and how we are conducting the observations. And it's clear that we will be there in your classrooms for around two hours and then we'll have periods of active observation and then you'll notice that either we step out of the classroom to write our notes and review our manual and then return back to the classroom and follow you for four different cycles and uh, different times depending on the age group that we are observing. So that's the general day of observation but would like our providers to know in scoring each of class dimension. How does that training align with uh, how we score. Uh, would you like to explain a little bit about uh, our report writing process and why we are like a crazy lady writing everything and our providers get like maybe a little bit anxious and don't worry she writing. Is good or bad that they see us writing during the observation? 
I mean, I'll start with um, the first question. Um, when we're in the classroom, we have our class lenses on. It's not my personal feelings. It's not what I think of the teacher. Uh, Teachstone does a lot of trainings, making sure that we don't have bias, that we are totally focused on the objective view and we wear our class lens and we're in there and we're using the manual to make sure that we are keeping true to the tool, not my feelings. Those don't come into play at all. Someone else can take the next question. I can piggyback off of you, Anna Maria. Um, the report writing process, we come back to the office, um, we go to the state system and we enter our scores. Um, first, we review it um, with the manual. And then once we enter the scores, we have a coworker check our scores because we are human and um, errors can happen. So they review it and we fix if we need to. And then we begin to write. Um, per DEL, we have 72 hours to submit our writing. And during that process, we reread it multiple times. We check grammar and then we do a final read through and then we submit before 72 hours. I think, Sandra, you mentioned why are we writing like crazy. It's important in when we're writing our reports that we have evidence to back it up. So a lot of our reports will have direct quotes of what we heard and what we saw. Um, for example, the teacher sat near the children while during circle time or, you know, whatever happened or she said X, Y, Z. So that's why we write so much and we're glancing up and we're looking around so that we have the evidence to support the score that we gave within that range and why it's uh, maybe you got a uh, five versus a seven or something like that. Um, and S Stephanie's got her manual up for me because my background blocks it out. Um, so we're using that. So you'll see us looking through. So during that period in Palm Beach, we do not step out of the classroom. It tends to be a little disruptive. So you'll see us flipping pages in our book to look and make sure if I say that this is a six, why is it a six? Does it align with what Teachstone has in the manual for a six? So there's frequent evidence of smiling and laughter or um, the children are engaged in an activity, whatever it is that I'm writing about, that manual helps me support that evidence. And that's why we write so much because it's really important to give that back to you when we are writing our report. And it is a process, like Amanda said, it is days of writing and we send it to a reviewer to make sure those errors aren't there and then we fix it and then we send it back again to make sure because like she said we're human and even the person reviewing it might miss something and then we catch it along those times so that we can give you just a very high level and well-written report. And just to add we also are very specific with the verbiage and the terms that we use to make sure that we're all uniformed and also we're um, utilizing frequency words so you understand if what we saw was a sometimes if what we saw was all the time and if it was something we saw only maybe once or twice. So we also concentrate on frequency words. So you really understand the depth of your interaction that we captured within that 20 minute cycle. And to, uh, to what Stephanie was saying, when we're scoring, we use a scale from one to seven. And sometimes you get those reports or your score and it says, oh, I got a one, I will get a two or I get a three. And we don't understand what those numbers mean. And to give you like a little bit of uh, information about that, if you score from one to two, that means that is in the low range. What it means is that when um, on that indicator, we, we find low uh, evidence or few evidence of what we were looking for. If you score from three to five, we that, uh, falls on, under the mid range and the mid range that means uh, that we saw or listened to some of the evidence that we were looking for. So sometimes you did it and sometimes you don't. And the last um, range is from six to seven that is considered the high range. And that means that you did it frequently, often, so that we found a lot of evidence uh, of those behaviors in your interactions with your, with your children. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we're providing very specific information that you can uh, understand a little bit more about the process that we follow, uh, how we are collecting observations and collecting evidence, and how the 
that scoring process goes above and beyond just up, we are doing really objective observations. We're following all the each some practice procedures to provide you with an score. That's why we will see all of us writing and collecting evidence and then comparing the evidence towards our manual. It's not that we don't know our indicators, it's that we forgot about something. It's a procedure that we need to follow when we are reviewing our observations in order to get all the evidence that we need to provide you with a full report that will make a full justification of your scores and why uh, you will need to uh, maybe improve in some areas. What Elizabeth was mentioning was the different uh, scores that you will get. And it will be important for you to take the moment to analyze those scores and to see it's not a, a bad score, it's just that we don't have enough evidence. If you look at your reports as information, uh, very specific information that you can use to improve your interactions, you will notice that we will tell you what are the things that you're doing and how often you're doing. That's why the frequency words that Stephanie was mentioning are part of our uh, reporting. So uh, let's move on to what to expect on the day of the class observation. We would like all our providers to know what to expect. Do they need to do something different? Do they need to prepare for our observations? Or what to expect on that day of the observation or during those uh, days of that window uh, that they have for our observers to come and visit the class? I think I'll take, I'll start off um, for me when I was a director and I used to tell my teachers this all the time, just do what you do every day. It's, you know, we really are there just to capture the natural flow, the genuine interactions that you have with your children. There's no prep outside preparation needed because you're making lesson plans, right? So you're already prepared for your day. Um, you have your materials and all those types of things. So there's no extra prep needed because you do it every day. And even when we do our CGC trainings, we're telling the ladies, you know, we see it. We know you do these types of things every day. There's no outside prep work needed. Feel comfortable that we are literally there just to look for interactions um, and just be yourself. I know people get nervous. I used to get nervous anytime somebody walked in and then I let that go because I knew what I was doing was right all the time when I was a director. I wouldn't have to worry when the health department showed up because we know bleach bottles are locked up and everything. I'm doing what I'm supposed to. So there's no need to worry. You just do what you do every day and we're going to capture it because when you change and you try to do something differently is when the children will tell on you housekeeping we can go in there or isn't it time to go outside now yes please take those babies outside because they get antsy they run around the classroom take them out don't worry about if I have to be there another 20 minutes or so take them outside just that's what I want to leave you with is just do what you normally do every day if I could add to what Crystal said that's absolutely true that's what I tell the teachers when I walk in please do what you normally do because when you change things that's when you're going to have problems because the kids are going to realize the routine has changed, that things are different, something's going on. If the teacher's nervous, the kids get nervous. They blame it on us, but it's the teacher that they're watching. The teacher, when we're up in an airplane, our guide is the stewardess. They are the stewardess for the children in the classroom. If she's nervous, they're nervous. They start acting up. Be as normal as possible. Go through your normal day so the kids stay on their routine. Um, I would like to add to everything my colleagues have said, it should be a typical day, your regular routine. Um, again, we'd love to take all those um, examples of what you're doing because you are doing all these things every day. So we know it's, it, it gives us a little bit of nerves when someone else is in the room. But again, that's another reason why we try to stay as um, a, a apart and not interrupt in the routine so that you um, can just function the way you, that you typically do. Um, and that way we get the best, um, we get the best of you in, in, in making sure that your day is typical, that we're kind of not a part of it. We're just a, a fly on the wall 
And, um, you know, again, if you do have those um, special occasion days and things like that, those are things to consider when, you know, we're coordinating on, on the front end before we even get out there just to make sure that, you know, we know that those um, special days happen because we know, we know there's a lot of activities that happen outside of a typical day um, in our schools. And so having that information so that, again, we give you your best opportunity to shine um, on that day that we come, but it should be the typical day because you shine every day. Thank you. Amanda? Just to add, um to go into further detail with the day of the observation. Yes, we do tell the teacher to try to, you know, keep as normal routine as possible because we do want to capture the typical day, but also um, we, go, we go into the center, we introduce ourselves. Um, same thing with the teacher. Um, we try to stay in a corner. We do um, stay for four cycles, depending on the tool, 15 to 20 minutes. And the assessor does follow the teacher throughout the cycles that were there. So if you guys go outside for free play, we do follow you. Um, even though for pre-K, if it's unstructured, we don't observe it, but we like to stay with the class to try to keep it as normal as possible. And then once the observation is over, we say our goodbyes and we proceed to leave. That's it. Thank you. Um, also, would you like to mention why we should not say anything after the observation? Because our providers are expecting the observer. We are there for a good amount of uh, the morning routine. We're writing our reports. We're not saying nothing. We're saying our goodbyes and we go. And they're like, what did she say? He didn't say anything. Would you like to explain why we cannot say anything at that moment? Well, for one, we want to make sure that um, what we are doing is um, we're being true to the tool. So we go back and we check what we've worked on and what we've scored. And that is very important. And it's important not to give you information you don't understand. So we want to make sure that you get the information within the reports. So you understand exactly what transpired during your day and what we captured that was supporting class and what areas that there's more opportunities to insert class. So we really want you to get that information via the report and via somebody who understands class to really um, understand your observation. So that's that's one of the reasons that I know I just say thank you for your time and I um, you'll be here you'll you'll receive your report if you request it when I speak to the director. Yes, we always explain, um, you know, I just say bye, have a great day or weekend or whatever the time of day happens to be. And um, so when I'm leaving, though, I will say it, it'll take us a few days to write our report and the system will generate the score. But if you have questions in the meantime, you can reach out to our director or whoever set up the appointment with them. And they typically some people will ask, you know, how did we do? And, you know, I say exactly what Stephanie said, you know, I'm not allowed to say right now, I have to go home and work on my report and review and everything like that. Because I understand you want to know and, but, you know, you know how you did, you did what you normally do every day. So there's really no need to worry, but we try to explain that it is a process and it, process and it will take a few days to uh, get that report anywhere from a week to two weeks. I think it's like two weeks time. And, um, it is a process, but also we're sometimes observing multiple rooms and we don't know how the different rooms are going to do. So if we say something and it doesn't match up with how the other room did, it could affect what we said. So we don't want to say anything until you have the full report for all the classrooms that were observed, not just the one we saw that day. Thank you. Um, so as you can tell, it's a very detailed process that we follow to give you objective and accurate information about how your interactions are going in the classroom. And thank you for all the comments and uh, explanation about what you will expect is just a visitor in your classroom. We don't want you to do anything different than what you do every day with your children. We would like to be uh, in a little Space that cannot interrupt or disrupt your routine. And um, 
will give you a full report uh, with the scores. Uh, every coalition have different timelines and different requirements, uh, but that's what we do. We collect our information, we prepare our reports in a very objective way, so that's why we cannot interact with the teachers and children in the classroom, that's why we cannot provide you with any feedback, our observations. Uh, that's part of the procedures that we need to follow as an observer. So it will be important for you to know that if know that we don't want to do uh, that we don't want to share any information with you, that we're not kind or that we're not accepting your accommodations in the classroom, is that we need to remain objective to our job uh, at data collection at that moment to give you the best feedback and information uh, of your program. Um, we're getting closer to our uh, uh, last part of the conversation. So uh, w w I would like to ask uh, my colleagues and assessors, what contributions do you feel that class observation is making in early childhood education? Why class now? How do you feel about the contributions that we're making to our early childhood education program? Sandy, I'm going to interrupt you just for one second. We do have some questions in the Q&A that I want to share with all of you um, after you're done with this question. So, Sandy, I apologize, but I just want to make sure we do touch on some of those. Okay, perfect. And thank you. Um, any contributions? How are we contributing to our early childhood providers uh, with this kind of observations, interactions, and feedback? I think that's such a deep question, right? There's broad answers for this, but um, as a trainer, I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. You know, we come in and we do our observation, but it really does provide opportunities for teachers to grow. You know, there's professional development within it. We capture it, we get a baseline. And like Elizabeth and Stephanie were saying, sometimes you may score in a mid area, but there's ways to improve. So it really is increasing those interactions, which we know increases the gains of children from very young. So t class has followed children through adulthood, right? So if we're starting at this very young age and we're improving our interactions as infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, when they're get, getting to third grade, their social interactions are higher, their cognitive abilities are higher, their language is more improved. So it really doesn't just stop here in pre-K, it continues on into elementary, high school, and all that kind of stuff. Because think about in your high school, think about a teacher that you've ever had, and you remember them, right? Now, is it a good experience or a negative experience? Either way, you remember. But we want to be the teachers that have those positive influences and impact on our children. And I believe class does that continually. And it's capturing all across the ages. So that's the contribution I feel that it makes from a training. You know, it starts here, but I help you get to the next level. But I'm sure my colleagues have other contributions that it can make. There's so many, you know. Thank you, Christelle. I can add to that. Um, I think we as assessors using the class tool were able to provide guidance as to how to implement quality and build on teacher child interactions, which are very, very important um, in early childhood because you know it takes them with them, you know, for further education. Thank you, I'd like, Amanda. I'd like to add that it also gives us a universal language of what quality is and looks like. So we're all speaking the same language. We're not being subjective. We're being objective and utilizing terminology that we all understand what that term means and what the behaviors and um, represent within that term. So I think it gives us new language to use across the board. Thank you, Stephanie. And this is like a wonderful example of that. We're three different counties. Uh, gathering together today to talk about interactions and we're speaking the same language. Thank you, Stephanie. Anybody else? Um, yes, hi, Sandy. I'd like to add that we've been using class um, for at least for the school readiness programs um, across the board since 2018. And we definitely can see that there's been a contribution to the improvement in quality. Um, when we first started going out in 2018, um, many were unfamiliar with, with class. And again, even though these are things that you're typically doing, doing it with the frequency and um, the indicators and the way that 
we're looking with our class lens um, is something that now we see um, gaining um, in the way that we had hoped that it would. And so I do think that the contribution is now um, backed up by um, the, the data and like seeing the increases in scores from year to year as we continue on this journey. So um, I just wanted to highlight that, that we are seeing it in the, even in the numbers, um, the composite scores as they come out um, year to year from our providers. I couldn't agree more with you because um, when we do our CGC sessions, right, we're, we're talking about teach, sometimes the teachers just come, they want to, but maybe it's a program that was on a QIP and we can see the growth in them after those 20 sessions, somebody else does their assessment and they get to, and they say, wow, you've grown. And even the teachers themselves, I have had teachers say, you know what, I didn't really understand it, but I know it now. And it's made such a big difference. I'm no longer struggling with my children for behavior because I've given choices or, you know, you know, this child really has accepted me because now I have a genuine uh, relationship with them, you know, so it really is making such a difference. And we're allowed, we see those in the outcomes of uh, the teachers when they do those trainings. And, and I've had providers also say the same thing that at first they thought these goals were unobtainable, but it has pushed them and they are obtainable and they can do it. And they've actually said, this has been wonderful experience for us to, to ha set a goal and to strive for that goal and to reach it. So yes, I've heard that from providers. And also if you want, you can go to teachton.com uh, and you will find more information about what we're talking about, books. Um, also they have videos uh, that explain a little bit more about what we're talking about. And in the meantime, until the next time we see all of you ladies, uh, you can be learning about uh, more about class and get some of those answers that you're desperately wanting to um, because we know as a teacher as we were before like that make us like feel nervous like what I have to do and we have a lot of questions so if you want you can go to www.teachton.com yes Maria that teachton.com and you can go there and find more information in the meantime. Thank you. And also remember that every early learning coalition has a professional development um, um, set of trainings, workshops, and, and different uh, support that you can access. Uh, just keep in touch with your early learning coalition and check on that website and look for that class. Uh, deep, we will have different uh, topics about class. Uh, so check with every early learning coalition and with your, uh, with your uh, people at the ELC to get more information about trainings, workshops, and more information about class. So thank you, everyone. Anna, would you yeah, like one, to yeah, I'll some give of you the questions? Yes, I think some of the questions are really interesting. We won't be able to get to all of them, but I just saw a question come, come through about what happens when, when you receive a low score. Would any of you like to um, tackle that? And I guess we're talking for anything that's under a four. Okay, I'll, go ahead, you go. I don't wanna talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of us really like to talk about it. I think that's why we're hesitant, um, but it's a reality. So, you know, let's, let's, let's process it a little bit. Um, you know, again, the hope is that um, you're, you've been doing, you know, the work. So besides all the great things you do typically that you're reaching out to your coalitions and getting these trainings that you're um, attending a CGC or an overview or any, any training that has like those class strategies embedded. So you've been working on this um, for a while before um, the observations come around. And, um, but unfortunately, you know, sometimes things do happen. We have bad days. Do remember that this is a, a composite. So each classroom is scored individually, but then your overall um, center score is a combination of 
all of those classroom scores. So even if one classroom maybe has a little bit of a, a rough day, um, maybe the other classrooms did much better. And so that will help. And then again, when you get your reports and you're able to um, identify where the areas of needs are, then you go back to your coalition and get that professional development going and get that, you know, that those areas of needs tightened up so that the next time um, there's a better outcome. But in the in in the case that, you know, there is a low score, these are things that are in place um, by the state, um, the Division of Early Learning at the, the state um, Department of Education set these rules they were passed and you know it's part of um compliance so if you do score below the 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 contract threat um the, con the minimum contract threshold which is that four um you would have the opportunity to request another opportunity to be assessed and so um the timeline for that is a little bit um it might be a little different in each of the coalitions, there, there really is no defined specific time for um, when the second observation ha or the second assessment happens, but it is something that you would have to pay for um, within a certain amount of time, because if not, your contract could um, be compromised, but that's a contracting issue, so I'm not going to talk about that because I'm not contracting, um, <laughs> but if you do pay for that um, second assessment and you do have a little bit of opportunity to kind of, again, reach out to us, like we're here to support you, you know, we can continue to provide you some professional development in that um, in interim time to, to support those areas that were, um, what brought down your score. And then hopefully on the second one, um, you know, you'll do You'll, you'll get that score that, that you need to continue to serve the families, which is what we all wanna do. We wanna continue to serve our families and we wanna continue to do great things for the children in all of our communities, so. Amy, I wanna jump you. in real quick and just say that um, the coalitions provide coaching. So say you do fall below that threshold. I think I mentioned it, a QIP, which is a quality improvement plan. The idea is not just to drop your contract. That's something completely different than VPK. We're not talking about that. Um, you would get a QIP where you would get hours of coaching from a coach in Palm Beach. It's separate than your uh, assessor. Um, you can do the CGC class group coaching, which is 24, but I think we're up to 36 hours of coaching, individual coaching, where the coach comes to your school weekly and they're working with you on the areas after they have read your report. So we would say we came out to your school in October before the end of your QIP, which is 12 months, we would do another assessment and that's where we would be able to see that growth that Amy is talking about because you've had coaching, because you've done CGC um, with someone else and you're able to grow and they're providing it for not only the one teacher in that class because it is like a lottery, right? You don't know who's going to get it. So it's important that all of your teachers get this training because at any given time, anybody can be assessed. So again, we do provide that training if you're scoring uh, low in that area. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, Amy. I wanted to um, take us to another place now. This is someone asking us, this is Virginia of Scafidas, who says um, to talk a little bit about assessing in a classroom with uh, English language learners. That's like the perfect segue for what you guys have going on today, right? We're going to talk about that. Um, I think uh, we're all now. It's, are, is she, does she mean like bilingual, like the teacher speaking, or she's just English language learners? Because we have bilingual assessors who come and they train. I myself am not bilingual. I understand a very little bit of Spanish, but I am trained to, you know, see what the teacher is doing to. Uh, capture those English language uh, learners. So does she have visuals for them? Is she translating for them? You know, the tool does capture that. It makes room for that. And I know Maria Christina Caro is going to talk all about that later, but I I'm, I'm just want to make sure I understand the question because we do have bilingual assessors that would go if that class is specifically bilingual. I think that's where we were going, Christelle, just to okay. confirm that that the language yes. is, yeah. Yes, it that is. That was that. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you set up your uh, appointment mm -hmm. or you get your window, you would say, oh, I have a Spanish-speaking class. And yep. then the coalition will send a Spanish-speaking assessor. Or if it happens to be Haitian Creole, they would send that person if they yeah. have it. Great. The mm -hmm. next question that we've got is about the aid. If there is an aid in the classroom um, and how does that 
fit into the observation. Remember that we are observing all the teachers that are in the classroom interacting with the children. Uh, under the eyes of the observer, it's not a teacher and a teacher assistant, it's just the other teacher that is in the classroom interacting with children. So all the adults that are part of the observation time, are we are considering the interaction that they're having with the children. So yes, we do take in consideration teachers, co-teachers, and teacher assistants. Another one. Um, so if if you're observing in a classroom and there is a, a, a child that gets pulled out because of an enrichment class, and does that affect anything when when children might move in and out of what's happening in the regular classroom that you're observing? No, I think it just changes the number. If they stay out for the next cycle, it would change the number mm -hmm. of children we capture in that cycle. We don't um, necessarily say, oh, where did that child go? You know, <laughs> uh, they just go and they do their thing. And then say you had 12 and now you have 11, we'll write 11 on our score sheet. Yeah, we're looking for the majority of children with the, the um, adult in the room. So we're looking at the, the majority. So one child less is not going to affect the scoring. Now, I, I would want to say, though, that it would be different if the whole class moved out. Um, we do know that a lot of schools have specials um, and, and different activities, or some of our faith-based um, programs have some devotion time. Um, those are periods where we would not be observing. It would be kind of like, like what Elizabeth um, said about the outdoor time. It, you know, if those activities are happening, um, you know, depending, if it's the same teacher, you know, there's a possibility that we might, you know, move along with them if it's one of those activities that would provide that interaction. But if it's like the devotion time, um, that would be maybe a time that we would stay in the room or we would watch the transition. We would go walk out and, and observe transition, but not observe the actual devotion time um, if that was an activity that is happening with the whole group. And I would, I would like to add on to that is that if, is there a therapist in your classroom with one of your children? We don't count that therapist interactions. We just count your interactions with that ch specific child uh, and with the rest of the children. So uh, any interactions that the therapist has with that child, we don't count, count those. That was perfect timing, Elizabeth. That question just came through the chat. <laughs> it came up. Um, we have questions that are already that you all have already touched on. Um, oh yeah, so this is not related to us now. Um, I can add one more thing. Please. If you are so stressful and you need more information, you want to know more about um, the observation, how it goes, or you want to learn more, reach out to your early learning coalition. We are your partners. We're here to help you. We are not the mean ladies that come to you to see what you're doing wrong. We are your friends. We want you to succeed in all of your areas and that your job is a pleasant uh, place to be and that your children learn a lot. So talk to us. If, for example, if you go to the Palm Beach State um, County webpage, our EOC webpage, there's a link that says request assistance and you can choose which assistant do you want and it's free of charge. We go to your school and help you. So please, please call us, um, get to us and we offer you any help that you need. Thank you. How about Broward County? Amy, do you want to talk about Broward County and I'll talk about Miami-Dade? Yes, of course. In Broward, we have um, similar to our colleagues to the north and to the south. Um, we do have monthly trainings that you can find on our website um, in our calendar of trainings. But we too have um, kind of like coaching on demand or technical assistance. Um, will come out with, you know, you can just request it. There is also on our website a request for that. Um, and we have a, an email, class at 
plcbroward.org that you can also make a request for any technical assistance, on-site training, virtual trainings. We we do a little bit of everything. We have an asynchronous, Stephanie. I don't know if you want to talk about the asynchronous that we have. Sure, we have an asynchronous course for the toddler infant age group as well as the pre-K age group, you still get your in-service hours and it's a self-paced uh, activity where you can learn as you go. You could do it all in one shot or you can piece the videos together and as you um, receive the information. So it's a really great overview of what class is and what it what does it look like in the classroom. It offers a lot of examples and shows some videos. So you can kind of just like, you know, make the abstract more concrete. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Palm Beach and Broward. So for Miami-Dade County, the Professional Development Institute has a whole menu um, that you can all select from. Everything we do is free and we teach from Monday to Thursday from 5.30 to about nine o'clock every night. We do offer the intro to class at the pre-K, toddler and infant level. These those courses, we actually offer them on behalf of Teachstone and you will receive a Teachstone certificate through us. It is our training team that does that. Separate to that, we do offer the class group coaching, which is MMCI, that many people know it as MMCI still. And that is the 12 week course, two hours per week. And it is by age group. We highly recommend that you sign up with us. We teach in both English and Spanish. And upon request, we would do uh, Haitian Creole. We, we would love to have you. I forgot to tell you, we also train in, on Saturday mornings. We will begin our next round of the uh, class group coaching MMCI in January. And we have wait lists uh, on our website for that. Before we leave, I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint that I actually put together that I haven't shared with you yet and I should have, which had our agenda and everything else on it. I have to tell you, I ended up changing places where I am and I left half of my stuff on the other desk. So that's, um, I apologize for that, but you will get um, links to all of our three um, coalitions uh, before the end and I'll put it on the screen so you can take a picture of it. And, and you'll be able to see that. I want to thank this amazing group of, of women who have come today to share <clears throat> their experiences and their uh, knowledge with us. This is just so valuable for everyone, for us, for our participants. Um, you are fantastic. And I also want to thank our interpreters. I did not introduce Lorena and Priscilla. These are uh, have been our friends for a long time now here at the Early Learning Coalition of Miami-Dade County, and they absolutely have helped us um, get the message out in an easy way all at the same time. And so we're very grateful for our uh, friends at Ola Doctor, which is uh, Ola Doctor, I guess is the name of their company, but they are just wonderful at what they do. So we're very grateful to them too. So women um observers and sandy thank you thank you all so very much um we just um look forward to doing a whole lot more of this with you and we all learned today i promise i did so thank you again